you got your Bibles, I'd love for you to join me in the book of Jonah. The book of Jonah. We're going to cover the last verse of chapter 1, and then the entirety of chapter 2, the 10 verses in chapter 2. We've been looking at this series, it's been kind of unique, because I did teach through this a couple of years ago, and as I talked through it a couple of years ago, we walked verse by verse, and we, and we looked at the story, and we exposited the text, and we looked through it. This time, my goal wasn't so much to catch every detail, but to look at the big picture. I wanted to see what is the main theme of the book of Jonah, and that is that God is sovereign. And really, when you look at it, every book of the Bible is, is it talks about the sovereignty of God. I, I was looking back on some of the things that I had taught, and, it, and it's funny because, you know, in the moment you think you're doing a pretty good job, and then I, I go back and look at some of the sermons that I preached to youth when I, you know, like, Ten years ago or more, and I, and I think, whew, that was that was interesting. That was that was, you know, an interesting time in my life. And now, gratefully, I can see that uh, my understanding of scripture has grown, uh, my ability to apply scripture has grown. And so, but looking back, one of the things I saw is a misunderstanding of the book of Genesis. Even going back to that, I was looking at some of my notes, and I realized I was teaching Genesis, and it was okay, but. I was giving the theme of the book of Genesis was God's relational aspect to mankind, and that's a part of it. God had a relationship with Adam, God had a relationship with Noah, God had a relationship with uh, Abraham and the patriarchs. But the whole point of the book of Genesis was that God is sovereign. That God was sovereign over creation, that God was sovereign over uh, this world when he flooded it, that God was sovereign over creating a people for himself. And, and then I started to look and realize that's the, the theme of every single book in the Bible. That the people of Israel were in, in bondage, in slavery, in Exodus in Egypt, and God was sovereign to bring them out for his glory, to display his glory in Egypt. God was sovereign in every single book. So that's what I want to look at here in the book of Jonah, and that's kind of what we've been, we've been exploring. We looked at God's sovereignty over his messengers. We looked at God's sovereignty over the sea, or the oceans. We looked at that last week, and tonight I want to look at God's sovereignty over the earth itself, over the physical planet that we live in and on, I guess, not in so much as, as on. But... Um, I want to look at this in Jonah chapter 1, verse 17, through the end of chapter 2, if you would join me there. Jonah chapter 1, verse 17. It says this, The Lord appointed a great fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the belly of the fish. I called to the Lord in my distress, and he answered me. I, call, I cried out for help from deep inside Sheol, and you heard my voice. You threw me into the depths, into the heart of the seas, and the current overcame me. All your breakers and your billows swept over me, but I said I have been banished from your sight. Yet I will look once more towards your holy temple. The water engulfed me up to the neck. The watery depths overcame me. Seaweed was wrapped around my head. I sank to the foundations of the mountains, and the earth's gates shut behind me forever. Then you raised my life from the pit, Lord my God. As my life was fading away, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer came to you, to your holy temple. Those who cherish worthless idols abandon their faithful love. But as for me, I will sacrifice to you with a voice of thanksgiving. I will fulfill what I have vowed. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Then the Lord commanded the fish, and it vomited Jonah onto dry land. Let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask for his guidance as we, as we look at this text. We're going to look at things in, in some unique ways. I have a, I have a take on this chapter uh, that disagrees with many of the commentaries, and I, I want to have a conversation about that this, this evening, but I want to look at God's sovereignty in this. Let's, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we love you, Lord. We thank you. We praise you. You are, you are sovereign. We recognize it in your word that each and every step of the way, you are sovereign. You've not left creation to its own devices. You've not just, uh, just taken your hands off the wheel and allowed the world to, to spin out of control. You have never, uh, you've never laid down your control. You've never taken your hand off the wheel. You are sovereign over nations. Uh, you said to Daniel that uh, you move the, the currents of human history and you put kings on their thrones. You move the king's heart like, a, like the course of a river. Uh, we know that you are sovereign over this planet, that in you 
all things hold together. That you are you are God. You created us. You know us. And, and you know, Lord, beyond what we can understand of, of the things that are happening in this world, you see what we can't. Your plans are higher than our plans. Your ways are higher than our ways. Your thoughts are higher than our thoughts. We rightfully submit to you and, and, and your wisdom, Lord, tonight. I pray that in the book of Jonah we would understand and we would see the big picture that this, this man ran like so many of us run from your will and, and from your word but you are sovereign over your messengers and you orchestrated these events to bring him to where he needed to be. And I ask you to do the same in our lives, Lord. When we are rebellious and stubborn and we move away from you, that you would take us and put us where we need to be. Lord, I, I, I ask you for wisdom in, in teaching this. Lord, we want to we wanna be faithful and... and um, and accurate. We want to rightly divide the word. And so I ask the Holy Spirit to, uh, to en enlighten us, to illuminate his word, and to point us to Jesus through it. Thank you for this time. Thank you for everybody here. Lord, bless them for their faithfulness. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Chapter 2 of the book of Jonah. This is so complex. This is so theologically rich. And this is so multi-layered. I say this about almost every text that I preach out of, but I think we could spend a long time here in, in this chapter. I feel like probably I could build at least, at probably a year's worth of sermons on, on this alone. We're not going to do that, but I, I just want to I want to look through this. I want to see every single time. I read something this week in a commentary that I really, really loved. They talked about the difference between a tourist and a treasure hunter. They said some people go to scripture as, as a tourist. They don't really know what they're looking for. They're just kind of looking for an experience. Uh, they may get some things. They may get some knickknacks and some souvenirs. But they're going to go home really, I mean, not having gained much from the experience. But a treasure hunter is different. They go in searching for something that's going to be harder to find. They dig deeper. They, they, they walk further. They go in different places. And they said really the only difference between them, they're both seeking something, but the difference between them is their level of commitment and intentionality. And I, I re when I see passages like this, I think this is, this is the opportunity for the church to become treasure hunters. We go in and we look at the treasure of his word and say, what is... What is here for us to grow and to glean and to, uh, to, to see the face of Jesus in this text? So, but I want to, at the same time, I want to keep big picture in our mind. I, it's, it's a battle and a struggle in my head. If you could get into my head uh, as I study through, it, it's, it's, a, it's a wild journey. Before we dive into the theology of this, I just want to analyze the story. Let's talk about the story. How did we get to this point? Because we started kind of out of context. The Lord appointed a great fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish for three days and three nights. How did we get to this point in the story? Because if you just start here, this is kind of ludicrous. I mean, if you had no, if you had no concept of the story of Jonah, and you're starting with this idea that a, a fish swallowed Jonah, I mean, this is this is beyond anything that we see or experience day to day. So, how did we get to this point? What happened in the story so far? Well, the, God told. Me him to go, and yeah. he, would, he refused, Yes. and then he was on the ship, and and they were praying to all the different gods, and he finally admitted, you know, it's me, it's, I did it, and they threw him over the, overboard to yeah. calm the seas. And good, it's always good to look at context, all these things happen, uh, Jonah got, Jonah really, I mean, we talk about God's sovereignty in this, we know that he is, he is orchestrating these events to put Jonah where he needs to be, but Jonah really put himself in this position. It was his. It was a series of choices that got him into into this place. So we see Jonah fled. God sent a storm. They ended up throwing Jonah overboard. I don't know about you, but when I grew up hearing this text, maybe this is just me. Maybe I'm maybe I'm remembering it wrong, or maybe this is how it was taught. But I remember learning that basically Jonah went overboard mm -hmm. directly into the mouth of the fish. I, I don't know. Maybe is, is, does anybody else remember the story like that? Uh, so I remember, okay, so I'm, I'm saying yeses and noes, mostly noes. I, I don't know why, I always assumed that the fish was like right there at the, at the surface waiting for him. Boom, he went in and he was right in there. But when you actually look at the story, and evidently y'all are, are way more close to the, the real story of Scripture here than, than I am growing up. But uh, it looks like there's uh, some overlap time between when he hits the water and when that fish swallows him. That compounds the... 
the, the, the horror, I think, of this story for Jonah. Because you think about this, he has to be thrown overboard. I believe this was some sort of assisted suicide attempt. I think he knew, I'm not going to run away from the Lord, so the next best step is for me to die. Because he still, I don't think at that point, when he went in the water, I don't think he intended to do what God had asked him to do. But he hits the water. Look what he says in chapter 2, verses 3 and 5, indicate that Jonah was drowning. That Jonah hit the water. It says, the current overcame me, and the waves swept over me. The water, in verse 5, the water engulfed me, and the depths overcame me. I think looking at this, knowing that it was God's sovereign plan to have a fish swallow Jonah, makes this a lot more significant, because it means that God allowed Jonah a moment of desperation in order to, to change his heart. And I, and I think that's what I'm, I think that was what we're seeing here in the text that there's a moment of panic in the water and it's that moment of panic I think that drives Jonah to pray the prayer that he prays here he says when this was happening to him then I remembered the Lord I remembered who he was I remembered these things and it causes him to pray this and this may not have changed anything in your understanding of this but it drastically changed mine because I grew up Maybe hearing or maybe just misremembering that Jonah is just like, bloop, right into that mouth of the whale. And, and it took some time in the, in the belly of the whale before he came to his senses. But I think what's happening here is we see, he, I mean, he, he was really forced with his own mortality, faced with his own mortality, and we see him kind of confront that. Yeah. In my version it says in, in um, verse 5, the water surrounded me even to my soul. So that's, we're going to talk about that because that's a better translation. Okay. Uh, neck is not, not the right translation here. It's a, it, it is talking um, symbolically there. But so either way, he ends up here, as verse 1 says, in the belly of the fish. I, I know we've heard the story over and over, and it, and it doesn't surprise us anymore because we've colored these coloring pages since we were kids, and we've heard this story, and we sang the songs, right? Uh, we, we know this story so well, but I just want to take a moment and, and talk about Jonah in this moment. Imagine you have done everything you can to get away from the Lord, and now you're in a place where you can't run anymore. He can't. The Lord put him in a place where the only thing that he could do was think and pray. Like that's it. There's no. You couldn't go anywhere. There was. There was no more options for Jonah. No more ships to go into. No more fares to pay. No more places to uh, escape to. No more options. He couldn't even kill himself like he intended. This was the, God put him in this place for a very specific reason to get him to think. And to pray. I'm going to talk a moment just about this fish. Okay. Um, growing up, you always hear Jonah and the whale is, is the idea. Um, so I, I've read a lot of different things about what this was. Was it a blue whale uh, that could have, I mean, you could get swallowed by a blue whale with no problem whatsoever. Was it a whale shark? Was it a specially created creature that God formed in this moment and created just to swallow Jonah? I, I, I will say, I'll, I'll answer all those questions. We don't know. And we can't know. The word that scripture uses here is the word daga in Hebrew. And it is used in the Bible for any type of sea creature. Anything. The Bible talks about small sea creatures, big sea creatures, salmon to sharks. I mean, everything in between. So it is such a vague term. Basically, it's talking anything that lives in the sea. And so that doesn't help us much in determining this. And I think that's probably intentional, because I think that's not the point of this. And we can spend a lot, spend a lot of time. I will say this, though, dive in deep. The Greek translation of the Old Testament is called the Septuagint. It was translated before Jesus' time. And Jesus, actually, that was his scripture that he would have studied from and read from. He quotes it very frequently. And they use, in Greek, the word katos for fish. And that is a unique word. It is, it is a lot different than just a general word for uh, uh, something that lives in the sea. It's not common in the Bible. It's only here in, and then when Jesus quotes it in, in the book of Matthew. But it is common in Greek mythology. And I think this is really, really interesting. Typically, in Greek mythology, this word was understood to be a sea monster. We're not talking about something common, even a whale would have been more common to them. This is something that they would have understood to be a mythological creature, a, a monster. In, in one myth, there was a queen named Cassiopeia and her daughter Andromeda. 
And she boasted that her daughter Andromeda was more beautiful than anybody on earth, including the wives of Poseidon. Poseidon was the god of the sea. Poseidon was ticked off by that. He, he was ticked off by her boasting, and so he sent a sea monster to kill Cassiopeia and Andromeda. Now, granted, we know that this is a myth. This is not real history, right? The sea monster was called Katos. That that's, was the name of this sea monster, and Jesus uses that same term in, in the book of Matthew when he references this text. So, for us, we may always kind of default to the story of it was a whale, for the people, the Greek-speaking people who, who listen to Jesus, they may have had a completely different understanding of, of what this word meant. They may have understood it to be some sort of mythological creature. And in the end of the story, it's pretty cool if you, if you enjoy mythology. Um, Perseus is the hero of that, of that story, and he ends up taking the severed head of Medusa and turning the, the sea monster to stone. It's kind of a, a, kind of a cool myth. Uh, but the, his listeners, Jesus' listeners, may have understood something very specific that, that we don't kind of see today because we, you know, we're, we, we don't have that same kind of mythology. But either way, I don't think we can make an argument in, in any direction. If it was a whale, I don't know, God could have taken a goldfish and enlarged it enough uh, to have swallowed Jonah. By that standard, God could have shrunk Jonah down and, and fit him into the, the belly of uh, you know, a sardine. I don't know, he could have done whatever he wants to. He is sovereign over the sea, over the creatures, over humanity. He made humanity out of dust, so why can't he do anything with it? So, either way, it really doesn't affect the story. I just think that was really interesting how how the, the different words in Scripture kind of came to us today. We could also sit and spend a lot of time looking at the science of how a person could survive for 72 hours in the belly of a fish, because modern science will tell you flat out it's not possible. Mm -hmm. But again, we're going to the book of Jonah, not trying to look at this and, and say, let's prove every detail. We're going to the book of Jonah, believing this by faith, that God wrote this, he inspired this. His spirit is not a spirit of deceit, it's a spirit of truthfulness. Jesus himself is truth. Jesus taught this as a true story. He says, and he even used it, how amazing, he even used this story as an, as an illustration of his own death. I mean, that is significant. So Jonah, in this moment, becomes a type of Christ. He becomes an image of what Christ would, would endure on the cross. So we can spend some time looking at that, how, how God gave him oxygen for this long, how God protected him from the stomach acids in, in the belly of the fish. We can do that, but we're not going to. We're going to accept this by faith and look at the main character of the story. It's not the fish, it's not the prophet, but it's God and his sovereignty. So I want to look at a, a few things here. I have bullet points, so I'm not going to spend a lot on each one. I just want to show you the big scope of God's sovereignty in this passage. Look at all the things that God had to keep in control in order for this to, to work out the way that it's supposed to. And it, it, it just constantly amazes me, church, like just trying to hold things together in my life, just trying to balance all the things. I don't know about you, but I tend to have a balance problem. I tend to look and say, uh, Lord, I, I'm, I'm doing okay over here, but over here it's, my life is a mess. And so putting all these things together, just trying, just trying to, to connect. I, I found out just this week, uh, or yesterday was Chloe's birthday, and I was looking, I was posting some pictures on Facebook, and I was looking back through my, my pictures on my phone, and I realized that I have about a third of the pictures of Chloe that I do of Sophie. And, it, and I don't know, parents, if you found this, but like, it is, I, like I thought I was doing a good job about trying to maintain both, but I guess Sophie does more interesting things or ridiculous things and I constantly take pictures. But keeping everything in your life in balance is tough. For, so for God to juggle all of these things, it's, it's no feat for him. For him, this is, this is what he has done since the creation of this world. But for, for me, it's amazing to look at what God does. In verse 4 of chapter 1, I know I'm going back, but look at this. It says, the Lord threw a great wind onto the sea. So God was sovereign over the wind itself. And then it says in verse 13, I'm sorry, and the storm. He threw a great wind onto the sea, and such a great storm arose. That storm was completely in the hands of God. And then in verse 13, after they throw him overboard, oh no, I'm sorry, before that, they're rowing hard, and it says they couldn't because the sea was raging against them more and more. 
It's not a coincidence. That's God, like we talked about last week, turning the dial up on the storm. He's in complete control of this. He's, he's sovereign over the wind, over the storm, over the sea. In verse 17, you see this. The Lord appointed a great fish to swallow Jonah. He's sovereign over animal life. He, he's sovereign whether he just commanded the fish or created the fish. It doesn't matter. God put that fish exactly where he needed to be in that exact moment. What a, what, I mean, I, I don't know where the fish started out, but he may have started out on the other side of the world. And it could have been months before where God commanded that fish, you need to start your journey because you're going to get a snack halfway through in the midst of, in the, midst of the Mediterranean. You're going, to, and you're going to need to connect at this very specific point. It's, a, it's amazing. I, I think about it in the New Testament in the book of Acts where uh, Philip, he's enjoying this amazing ministry in Samaria. People are being saved and all these things are happening. And God says, I want you to go to the middle of the desert. And I know Philip, and his heart's probably thinking, Lord, I'm doing good here. People are being saved here. What, what are you sending me there for? But he goes and he finds a man on the road, just happens to be right there, a, a man who is searching the scripture and looking for truth, and Philip is able to give him the gospel. Well, like, what an amazing thing. It's God's sovereignty over everything. So, it is sovereignty over animal life. In chapter 2, verse 1, you can make an argument here, because he says he, he was in the belly of the fish. You can make an argument that God is sovereign over our human life, and we know that, but specifically giving him enough oxygen to breathe and to not be overcome by the, the acids in the fish's stomach. That's, I believe that's God's sovereignty. I believe that God was protecting Jonah in, this wasn't a natural thing, I believe that this was a supernatural moment. In verse 2, you could argue that God is sovereign over sound waves, because Jonah cried out from a place that nobody on earth could hear. Nobody could hear that. I feel like in our home, Nobody can hear anything. It, it's crazy. You'd be like, Chloe. <laughs> Chloe. <clears throat> Chloe. And then after a few times, it's like, I'm tired of this. Chloe! Like, you just, please listen to me. And she comes out like, what? I didn't hear you. And I'm like, you, you heard me. But Jonah's crying out. Nobody can hear him. There, there's not one person that can hear him on this planet except for God himself. And God... He, he, because he is omnipresent, he is everywhere, he hears Jonah's cry, he hears the prophet's cry from a location nobody else could hear. So he's sovereign, I believe, over the sound waves. He's also sovereign over the ocean waves that carried the prophet right where he needed to be. It says that the billows and the breakers were, were washing over him and all these things were happening and, and he ended up exactly where he needed to be. Verse 6 talks about the foundations of the mountains and the earth's gates. So it says, I sank to the foundations of the mountains and the earth's gates shut behind me forever. He's talking about some very deep locations in the earth. And even though Jonah is, is speaking metaphorically that, the, that he's at the, the foundation of the mountains or the earth's gates, we can conclude God is sovereign over this actual planet that we live on. We read about this in the book of Genesis, that the, the fountains of the deep were opened, and that's what started kick-started the, the global flood. But it's amazing. At the end of verse 9, But as for me, I will sacrifice to you with the voice of thanksgiving. I will fulfill what I have vowed. Why? Because salvation belongs to the Lord. We're taught that God is sovereign over salvation, and we'll talk about that a little bit more next week. And then in verse 10, we see God's sovereignty over biology, over animal life in this very specific scenario where it says the Lord commanded the fish and it vomited Jonah onto dry land. I don't know who had the worst go of this. Jonah or this fish? I don't know. One of them had, both of them had a bad situation. But you see all of these, these details show God's complete sovereignty. He had this whole story in the palm of his hand. Nothing happened where God said, well, that's not what I intended. I, have all, I, wish I, I, I wish I would have made the storm just a few miles east or something. And we see God's complete sovereignty over the situation. And church, right there, if we would just end right there, this would have been a profitable time for us. Anytime that we can stop and look at God's greatness and list uh, the, the different ways He is sovereign would be reason enough for us to meet and, and praise His name and sing songs and look at this word. But one of the really interesting things that we're presented with in this passage is not only God's sovereignty, but how Jonah responds to God's sovereignty. And that's kind of what I want to spend some time looking at. Because it says in verse 2 that Jonah called to the Lord in his distress 
and cried out while he was drowning. This is a significant moment for the prophet. This is the first time that we've seen him speak to the Lord in this. Before, God said, go, and did Jonah say no? It's not recorded that he did. He might have said it, but it's not recorded. He just said no through his actions. But here we see him actually speaking and interacting with the Lord, and that's, and that's really unique. Verse 7 suggests it, he might have been almost dead when it happened. If you look at verse 7 in chapter 2, it says, as my life was fading away. Now, he, this is poetry in this section. This is a poetic uh, recollection of what was happening. But, I mean, he may have been almost dead, almost drowning. And he remembers, okay, uh, finally I remember the Lord. But it doesn't tell us much. This is just talking about his physical situation. It doesn't tell us much about his spiritual situation. I think anybody would cry out given these circumstances. I mean, I know I would. If I'm, I'm flailing around in the ocean in the storm, I, and, I, and I'm getting sucked down, it says that seaweed was wrapped around his head, and I don't know, that may be, that may be metaphoric, that may be literal, but I think anybody would, would cry out. It, it's interesting how he could cry out underwater, and that really just kind of intimates kind of a, a primal, guttural scream that even in uh, the, the book of Romans it says that the Holy Spirit understands our prayers even when we can't articulate the words. And I know that's out of context with this, but kind of looking at that idea that how he was, how he was crying out. But again, it doesn't tell us much about his spiritual situation. And, and that's what I've been kind of concerned about with Jonah. We actually talked about in week one in here that we had that discussion whether we would see Jonah in heaven or not. And I think that's a really interesting thing. We're not going to rehash that, but I want to kind of explore his, his, his mindset here, given these life or death circumstances. Warren Wearsby said this, his prayer was born out of affliction, not affection. He cried out to God because he was in danger, not because he delighted in the Lord. So it, Warren Wearsby kind of went in that direction. And this is, I'm going to make a statement here, and I want to kind of talk through this together with you. I want to see what you think about this uh, and maybe how we grew up. Maybe it affected our understanding of this, but I do not believe that chapter 2 is a picture of Jonah's spiritual revival. I, I don't. I don't think anything he says here is indicative of a heart that is changed. And that's what I kind of want to talk about. So, first reactions, without looking at the text in detail yet, uh, what do you what do you think about that statement? Am I am I way far off base, or or does do you your, see does it? Does your uh, version say the Lord is God? Yes. Okay. And it says yeah in verse one, and then also in uh, uh, let's see, he says, uh, and then in the end of verse six, he he also says, uh, "You raised my life from the pit, Lord, my God." Yeah. So. so it it was a personal God. A lot okay. of times you'll read somewhere else, the Lord, your God, talking about their God, but he says he cried out to the Lord, his God. Good, okay. So I think it was personal. Okay. Now whether it was repentant or not, mm -hmm. like you said, I think he knew God. Yes, I agree with that for sure. Yeah. I, I, I don't think, I don't know if it's a revival, spiritual revival for him, but it's certainly a remembrance of life. Okay. Mm -hmm. so I, I, I have being one way, and I remember who you are now, and how, how great you are. Okay. Because, you know, he mentions it, not salvation belongs to the Lord. Mm -hmm. You know, the Lord, and he talks about how the Lord spoke to the fish. I mean, he, he knew, yeah. he knew, he knew God who he was. He did remember it. Yeah. I think his instinct is cervix, uh, survival, okay. as opposed to spiritual sense. Sure. And that's and that that's where I'm I'm leading. I think all of y'all are right. I don't think there's anything. I mean, I think the way that we interpret this, ultimately, we know it's going to happen, and so that's the main story that God has been sovereign over this. Uh, but I think if we, you know, like we've done in the Book of Revelation as well, I think we can we can go in different directions in, in, in certain aspects of this, and I, and I think it'd be fine. Uh, if it was a spiritual revival, it didn't last very long. Yeah, wow. yeah, yeah. That's, and, and you know, I, last time I talked through Jonah, I, I brought that up in this idea of his life mirrors the story of the people of Nineveh, that he had a moment of being confronted with his own mortality, and he had a, a very, you know, he, he on the surface repented, and 
we see the same thing in Nineveh. They're presented with the, the image of God's wrath and judgment. They repent. But then Jonah, obviously it's a short-lived repentance. And for the people of Nineveh as well, within a hundred years, they, they abandon the Lord and God destroys them in the book of Nahum. So that, there's definitely something to, to look at there. I just, when I look at this, I don't think we're witnessing a sincere turnaround in Jonah's attitude or, or his obedience. I, what, how he's responding to the Lord is one thing, but I don't believe what I'm seeing here is him saying, okay, Lord, I see why you're calling me to go there, and I'm going to do it. I, I, I don't see, I don't think, and that may be harsh. Maybe I'm just piling on Jonah, and he's in heaven right now saying, dude, like, <laughs> I did it, didn't I? Didn't I go and do what he asked me to do? I don't know, maybe maybe that's, maybe that's uh, uh, being harsh. But there's a couple of things. There's some key elements, one, key elements missing from his prayer. That, that we see, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of take him and compare him and contrast him with another story of repentance, because I, I want to see the differences there, so there's some key elements missing. And then, Bob, to your point there, we also see that his spiritual condition in chapter 4 doesn't improve. So he, he, he starts in one place, he ends in largely the same place. And so that's what I kind of want to look at. There's a lack of immediate evidence of Jonah's sincerity and long-term evidence. But I do, to everybody else's point, I do, I do want to be clear in here that Jonah is reacting to God's sovereignty and he absolutely recognizes what has happened. Jonah is not sitting in the belly of the whale thinking, well, I don't know how I got here. He fully realizes what has happened. In verse 3, he says to the Lord, you threw me into these depths. I mean, he absolutely understands that God was sovereign. He, he didn't say the sailors threw me in here. He didn't say I chose to be here. He says you threw me into these depths. Verses, verse 3, at the end of verse 3, this is my paraphrase, but he also says you caused your waves to sweep over me. He, he recognizes that as he's in the water, that God is, God is continuing his, his chastisement, his discipline here. Uh, it says in verse 4, you banished me from your sight. And again, we're recognizing, now that's not a true statement, but we are recognizing that Jonah fully sees that the Lord is the, the impetus here. The Lord is the, the one moving this story forward. And then in verses 2 and 6, he talks about Sheol or the pit, which was their understanding at that point of, of hell or the, the afterlife. And we'll talk about that. If you're really interested, we'll talk about that on Wednesday night um, in, our, in our study on, on Wednesday night. So he's fully realizing... Positively, I want, I want to say some good things about Jonah. Uh, because really, in my heart, I do believe that we will see Jonah in, in glory. I, I really do. I believe that he is there in the same way that I believe David made some gigantic mistakes and, and committed some grievous sins in his life. In one, I just heard a message from Adrian Rogers the other day talking about um, David's sin in, in numbering the people. And it caused, like, I, I, I'm... I'm just saying this off the top of my head, but like 60,000 people to perish as a result of this. David made some huge sins. He committed some, some grievous sins, but the Lord still called him a man after my own heart. So I, 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 I'm saying a lot of negative about Jonah, but I do believe <coughs> that God used a sinful person to, to bring about his plan. But I want you to see positively, he recognizes God's sovereign over the situation. He knows this isn't an accident. This wasn't just a coincidence. What a coincidence that would be. Can you imagine living your life thinking that these kind of things just happen? Like Jonah wanted to die and he's thrown over and a fish just happens to swallow him and then vomit him on dry land. I mean, if you're an unbeliever, that's why you would go to the story and say this isn't true. That this is a metaphor uh, for something else. But we understand as believers, as specifically believers who look at this literally, that we, that we understand God can do this and more. He, I mean, he, he can do anything that he wants to do. And so positively, he recognizes he's got a right understanding of the situation. I am here because God wants me to be here. So that's positive. He understands God's sovereignty. Another positive thing that I want to say about Jonah is that he understands that this fish is not punishment. I think that would be a, a, a thing, you know, sometimes in our lives when we go through belly of the fish situations and scenarios where we look and say, God, why are you doing this to me? Why are you punishing me like this? If I repent, if I, if I promise to not do these things anymore, will you, will you get me out of this situation? Jonah has no, no idea like that. He's not looking at the situation and saying, God, why are you punishing me? He, he fully understands that God has 
rescued him. Remember, he says, I, when I was, my life was fading away, I remembered the Lord, and I prayed, and what did it say? Let's see in verse 6. The earth's gates shut behind me forever. Then you raised my life from the pit. As my life was fading away, I remembered the Lord. My prayer came to you. And then, uh, talking about in verse 9, salvation belongs to the Lord. He understands this, this fish was, was salvation for him. It rescued him. David Guzik said that uh, the fish was a lifeboat for Jonah. It was in, in much the same way that the ark was for Noah, that, that this fish rescued him and bore him through the sea and, and, and rescued him. So there's some positive about this. I want to be fair to Jonah, but also now I want to talk negative. Because there's no trace of repentance here. There's, there's an understanding of God's sovereignty, but there was no trace of repentance. There's nothing in this that talks about his own sin. There's nothing in this where, and, and again, I say this, we can't make an argument from silence. Maybe this isn't all that he said. There may have been more that was not recorded, but this is what God gave us to work with. And as I look at this, I don't see anything where Jonah says, God, I realize what I did was wrong. I realize that I should have gone. I should not have run. I, I should have just followed you. Look at the difference if you join me in Psalm chapter 51. Psalm 51. Psalm 51, in context, this shortly follows David's sin with Bathsheba. And, and we're not going to get into it. We will eventually when we go through the book of First and Second Samuel. But in, in that story, he sees a woman. He lusts after her. And I believe he does what amounts to rape and, and kills her husband in order to cover all this up. I mean, this... It's a snowball of sin and wickedness, and he is confronted by the prophet Nathan. God sends Nathan, and, and I think that's an interesting thing. God sent Jonah to point a finger and, and say, repent. God sent Nathan to go to the king and point a finger and say, repent, and Nathan just did it. He stood before the king and said, thou art the man. And so David repents, but look at his, look at his repentance. And I know... Again, we're talking two different people in two different situations. But look at how David repents. I'm, I'm going to read, I'm, if you allow me, I'm going to read the whole thing. Be gracious to me, God. According to your faithful love, according to your abundant compassion, blot out my rebellion. Completely wash away my guilt. Cleanse me from my sin. I'm conscious of my rebellion. My sin is always before me. Against you and you alone I have sinned and have done this evil in your sight. So you are right when you pass sentence. You are blameless when you judge. Indeed, I was guilty when I was born. I was sinful when my mother conceived me. That's a, that's a little bit dramatic, I think. I mean, he, I, but it's a right understanding. I'm, I'm not just sinful now. I've been sinful from the moment that I was conceived. He says in verse 6, Surely you desire integrity in the inner self, and you teach me wisdom deep within. Purify me with hyssop, and I will be clean. Wash me, and I'll be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you've crushed rejoice. Turn your face away from my sins and blot out my guilt. God, create a clean heart for me and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not banish me from your presence. <coughs> That's something that Jonah specifically said. You have banished me from your presence. Or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore the joy of your salvation to me. Sustain me by giving me a willing spirit. Then I will teach the rebellious your ways and sinners will return to you. Save me from the guilt of bloodshed, God, God of my salvation. My tongue will sing of your righteousness. Lord, open my lips and my mouth will declare your praise. You do not want a sacrifice where I would give it. You're not pleased with a burnt offering. The sacrifice pleasing to God is a broken spirit. You will not despise a broken and humble heart, God. In your good pleasure, cause Zion to prosper. Build the walls of Jerusalem. Then you will delight in righteous sacrifices, whole burnt offerings, then bowls will be offered on your altar. Tell me, talk about, let's talk about the differences between this prayer and Jonah's prayer. Sincerity. Sincerity. To his, to his credit, Jonah did take responsibility in chapter 1. He told him, this is because of me, I'm, yes. you know, but he didn't do anything about it. He didn't, there was no repentance to right. the confession. Good. Well, could you explain verse 8 to me? Yes, we will talk verse 8. Um, it it's really interesting, and there's a lot of controversy. Um, 
Let, we'll leave that just in just a sec. This chapter is more about Bessie, um, David's main person like, is God. And Jonah's in chapter 2 is just all about himself. Mm. And um, I don't know, I think that's more, I think that says more about Jonah's personal struggle with um, whatever things he's going through. Mm -hmm. <coughs> What about that verse 9 where he says, that I have vowed, what I have vowed I will pay? Mm -hmm. And then he talks about salvation. Yeah. I mean, he, I mean, here's a guy that looks to me at his life flashing before him. Yeah. And just what happened to him. In how long, I don't know. But, and, he, and he goes off to everything that happened to him. And then he says, I'll pay it. That's sincere to me. Okay, and and I would I, I wouldn't disagree with you. I mean, we're not gonna I, I, just uh, this isn't this isn't a, a point of contention. Yeah, I understand. But, yeah. I understand. And and I, and I and I I rightly recognize that. Yeah. But he's not stating what he did. He like David did. David True. is taking yeah. re he's re realizing and taking responsibility for everything he did, every sin. Whereas <coughs> Jonah is just like in the moment. Yeah. And. Repentance takes surrendering, mm. and I don't think Jonah surrendered. I think he lost hope. Mm. I think he thought he was going to die, yeah. and I think he realized God did all this. Yeah. So I do believe he knows God is sovereign, but I don't think he was repentant in the fact that he was surrendering again, mm -hmm. like he would have in the beginning. Yeah. Yeah. It seems more like, uh, I'm in the situation, I'm about to die, I'll do anything to get rid of that. So that's whereas, that's where I land as well yeah. with whereas David, he's I mean he's not about to die because of what he just said. He's a king. Yeah. And that's where I think the genuine repentance is. And I mean you can compare it to I know like King Nebuchadnezzar his isn't is even as profound as mm. uh, Daniel or as uh, Jonah's is, but Nebuchadnezzar repents multiple yeah. times. Uh, king Saul he repents of trying to kill David yeah. multiple times and every time <laughs> just, it's just a process, repeating. So then how do we know the difference between genuine repentance and uh, repentance of words only? The heart. By, by the actions of the heart. Of the heart. Yeah. Was Jonah a prophet before this time? So we, I, I think we briefly talked about that week one. Uh, there's two, two schools of thought. Uh, there are some people who believe that he was already a respected prophet and that, that he had done things before. There are some that they believe that this is the first thing that God had asked him to do, and he did go on to do things later. Because in Jewish theology, even at the time of Jesus, he was a respected prophet. Not a, not this, there was obviously more that he did, but whether it was before or after, we don't know. If he was respected, it would make sense that this would be the first thing. Could be, yes. And then you know, that there was more later to the story. Right. Yeah. Well, that that kind of, that version kind of makes sense if it because he hadn't done it. This is the first time God is using him. Mm -hmm. Even that verse, those who claim to work with that, I'm not going to do what God says. You know, I'm not going to Nineveh. Yeah. He was immature. Yeah. Good. Well, he kind of got the impression he may have already been one because he God had told him before to go tell people. Yes. And that could be what. I have vowed I will pay. You know, I will go tell him. But like you say, there was no repentance. He might have made a vow to, to serve God. Mm -hmm. But then, you know, when God told him to do something difficult. Mm. Well, you know, and you look at what David said in verse 10. I mean, what my uh, yeah. New Living Book says, created me a clean heart. Yes. You know, that's what he's asking for. Renewed the spirit within me. There is a sincerity there that Jonah never had. Mm -hmm. you know, I mean, that's not but, but I think one thing about David, he had time. Okay. Uh, Nathan talked to him. So he had, he did it. Yes. There was a time frame. God talked to Nathan. Nathan came. Then he had time to process it. Okay. Wasn't there a big difference, though, between Jonah and the Ninevites uh, in the fact that Jonah, uh, they were enemies as yes. far as Jonah was concerned? Yes. And God was asking him to go to his enemies and preach, uh, preach to them mm. repentance. Mm. Yes, I, I think the going to the ministry right. and it's not like they pictured. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. 
and they decide, I'm going to do what God told me to do. Yeah. I, I think you're right, and I think, Charlotte, to your point, I, I think this is, this is probably the biggest ask, a command of any of the Old Testament prophets. I mean, Elijah was asked to go to the king Ahab and, and confront him about his sin, John the Baptist about Herod and his sin, but this is, I mean, this is something more, a, a bigger, costlier, more extravagant ask. And so I think there's got to be some grace given in, in something like that. And I, I love, uh, was it, Janine, what did you say about the, or no, uh, Gary, about the time, the time to process. All these things are so good. This is, the why, this is why we teach the way that we do, to engage and to really get at the heart of it. And I think ultimately, I want to I wanna be able to finish this on time, but ultimately, I think you could probably land on either side of this and, and be okay. Theologically, I think, yes, sir. I still don't think he believes he did anything wrong. Oh, okay. <laughs> Which is why he never repents, and he never, and, and then when, even in chapter 4, when he actually goes, mm -hmm. then he says, this is why I didn't go before. Yeah. Because, he, you know, I truly don't think he thought he was doing anything wrong. So yeah. he drew the line of hate. No, selfish. Mm -hmm. Talked about being selfish. You know don't hate your enemy. Yeah. Pride. Have you learned to love your enemy. Yeah. But that was a whole new ethic that Jesus instituted Jesus that was not yeah. the case. Right. Because in David's situation, his response, I mean, his, his relationship with like the Philistines in his situation was fight, kill. Now, at one point, he joined them for a while. Yeah. But, I, I mean, even... So, we are in a different... I mean, it would have been like going to David and saying... Go, and the people you've been fighting your entire life, go and, and preach to them and tell them to repent. That's a, that's a big ask. Well, you know, when they came out of Egypt and went into the Promised Land, God didn't say, go in there and tell these people about me yeah. and convert their hearts. He said, go and wipe them out. Yeah. And that was the mindset they had down all through this time. And even in the New Testament, the Jewish people felt the same way about the Samaritans that Jonah felt about the Ninevites. Yes. You know. Yes. Yeah. So... Going back to Thomas, I think you made the point earlier. I think what we're seeing here in verse 9, as for me, I will sacrifice to you uh, with the voice of thanksgiving. I will bow. I, maybe I'm already reading this with a lens of, of negativity, but I, I see this as a, when it says I'll fulfill what I have vowed, it, it feels so much like a get me out of this and I will do anything. Kind of prayer. I, I, I will serve you. I, we've been in that. Get me out of the situation, Lord. I'll read my Bible every day. I will tell so many people about you. I will do anything. That's kind of what I see here. And, and, and what strikes me here, Jonah says, I will sacrifice to you. But David reminds us in Psalm 51, you do not want a sacrifice or I would give it. You are not pleased with a burnt offering. The sacrifice pleasing to God is a broken spirit. You will not despise a broken and humbled heart. And I don't believe I'm seeing that from Jonah in this moment. And we're not, I, because even if, if this is a moment of repentance, it's, it is short-lived. Because we're going to see as we go next week in chapters 3 and 4 how, uh, how he responds to Nineveh's real repentance. That's, that's the thing. You see Jonah's repentance here, uh, this, to me, very shallow, right understanding of God's sovereignty. But that's when we have the picture. The, the reason why God is sovereign and, and uh, exhibits His holiness through His wrath is because of our sin. Without a recognition of our sin, we don't really understand the gospel. But then you see the people of Nineveh, when they hear the story, uh, how is their repentance marked? They, they tear their clothes, and they cry out, and they pour uh, ashes on their heads, and they put, put sackcloth on from the king to the lowest servant. You see a kind of repentance there that I'm not seeing here. Now granted, he doesn't have access to these things, and he is in pitch black darkness. So maybe we'll give some grace there. But regardless, I, I just think this is a really interesting thing, and I hope I gained something from uh, studying through this. But, but uh, going back, uh, who asked about uh, verse 8? Okay, verse 8. Uh, I, and I, I had it in my notes, and I, and I cut it at one point just uh, because for the sake of time, but I think, is that going? Yes, it's almost, okay, it's almost six. Let's do this. Um, verse 8, he pivots here from speaking to the Lord to speaking to others. 
And, and that's, that's an interesting thing in the middle of a prayer. It's not uncommon, though, in the Old Testament ways of, of prayer to, to go from, because it's all theology. It's all the way to teach. But he is, he is teaching this. So there's two, basically, if you look at, and I wish I had my, my notes here about this, but there's basically two ways that, that this is translated. And depending on the version of the Bible that you have, you might see this in, in a different way. My version says, those who cherish worthless idols abandon their faithful love. So the onus is on the people. He's saying, when you do this, you, you are walking away. Uh, and you're abandoning the Lord. The other way that this is translated in some versions is that um, when you do this, God's grace is still available to you. That, that, that you, are, you are walking away from something that is still available. And so there are two ways uh, that, that we see this translated as... Um, and so depending on that, depending on that, how you translate this, this could affect the way that you see all this. Because some people would look at cherished worthless idols, because he's, he's recognized, like, I think you could probably make the argument that in that statement alone, he is recognizing that what he has done is idolatry. That, that he has done something where he prized something over the Lord and the Lord's commands. And so depending on how you look at this, abandon their faithful love, uh, some versions... Mean like that you have walked away and there's no chance. Other versions uh, kind of give the idea that you you are walking away from something that God is extending to you, a grace that He's extending to you. How you interpret that could affect the way that we look at jo how Jonah ends up. If you look at that as even though we walked away, God's offer of redemption is always present. That He that He doesn't ever uh, stop offering that. Uh, it's a really interesting thing, but especially the pivot from speaking to God to speaking to others. And so there's a lot of people, a lot of commentators who look at that and say that Jonah may not have said that, that somebody else that, that recorded this put that in. Because somehow, whether it was God's the Spirit speaking to a, a, an author, Jonah did not write this. This was written later than Jonah. And so Somebody had to have known this, and they may have made a, an annotation and a note about that specific thing. But um, however, however we land on it, it is odd. It's an odd turn of phrase. It's an odd thing to be speaking to the Lord about this moment, and then to turn and, and start teaching uh, other people about this. But um, look at it. I, I would encourage you, go online and look. Uh, if you go to like sites like Blue Letter Bible. I use Blue Letter Bible almost every single day. It's a fantastic tool. But you can see the Bible, each verse, in all the different translations that are available. You can see it, what it looks like in the original languages, and it breaks it down really simply. I, I definitely recommend that. Uh, and then going back to, I, I forget who brought up um, about verse... Oh... Um, oh, the watery depths overcame me. Or, okay, verse 5. The water engulfed me up to the neck. Uh, this is, I, it was you. Okay, so what, tell me again what your version said right there. That's verse 5. Because you had the right translation. This is, the, the word here is, is not uh, neck. Mine says, the water closed in over me to take my life. The deep surrounded me. Okay. So, it surrounded me even to my soul. Okay, so the, the, the Hebrew word in there is the word soul. So he is not just speaking physically. He's not just saying the water's coming up around him. He's speaking also spiritually. That the, 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 he, he, he feels like his soul itself is drowning. It is a common phrase to speak about your soul as a part of your body in, in the Old Testament. To talk about, to kind of anthropomorphize it, where you would look and say, my being is... Is, is being flooded, is, is kind of what, um, what he was saying. So, there's a lot here. Like I said, we could spend so long. But big picture, we want, to, we want to look at this big picture. You may disagree with me. And, I, and, I, and there are certain times that I hope people do, because I want us to be Berean believers. The book of Acts, uh, chapter 17, talks about how they listen to Paul himself. I mean, the writer of the book of Romans and Ephesians, the greatest theological text that have ever been written, 
And they looked at him and they said, we're not going to believe you just based on what you say. We want to search the scriptures and make sure it lines up. That's, that's my prayer for all of us, is that we would look and say, you know what, he said this, but, and many of you have said, well, but the scripture says this, and what about this? And I love that kind of, that kind of feedback. If we, if we disagree, that is, that is perfectly okay. Many of the commentators that I read this week also disagreed, including John MacArthur. And so... Um, that's always, for me, a very scary place uh, when, when you're in a place where somebody who has taught Scripture for 50 years <laughs> disagrees, and then I think, okay, I really need to go back and, and reevaluate. But my, my, good, my good friend and soul brother, Warren Wearsby, agreed with me. So uh, that, was, that was enough for me this week. But we're still brothers and sisters in Christ, and we we got to be careful even in, in looking at controversies like this about taking a portion of a book and building theology from it. We got we got to be we got to look at consistently across all of Scripture and then especially across the whole of this book and we're going to see more about this character next week. Ultimately, though, it's not about Jonah. Ultimately, God is sovereign. He's sovereign over his messengers. He's sovereign over the sea and the ocean. He is sovereign over the animal life. He is sovereign over the whole earth. He's sovereign over this universe. So I want to I want to pray tonight. Um, and, and give him glory for his sovereignty. Let's do, let's do that. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we love you. We thank you. You're so good to us. Um, Lord, we recognize in the, in the story of Jonah here, whether he repented or not, we, we see that ultimately you were doing a work, that you were bringing a messenger to the people of Nineveh so that 150,000 people at least would repent. What, what, a, what a great God that we serve. What a great God that you would look at people who are your enemies and, and offer them a gift of, of mercy. Lord, you did that with us. While we were still sinners, you died for us. I'm grateful for that, Lord. And I pray that as we look at this, we recognize your sovereignty each and every day. That every breath we take is, is a gift from you. Every time our, our heart beats and pumps blood through our bodies, that is your sovereignty over the grand design of, of your creation. We give you praise with what breath we have. Lord, I pray that even if we look at this story and, and maybe disagree that Jonah was really sincerely repentant, I pray that it wouldn't stop us from being sincerely repentant. That this would kind of draw us this week to our knees. And we would look at you and get on our knees and like David, pray and ask you to, to cleanse us. And to remove the, the guilt from us. That, that we would seek out the, the parts of our lives that we have consistently uh, kept, Lord, from you. I pray that you would, you would create in us a clean heart and renew a right spirit, restore to us the joy of your salvation. I pray that you would do that through the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives, that you would, Lord, do a work in us this week. Thank you for these amazing people, these people just hungry to hear your word and to discuss your word. They bless me, Lord, and I, and I thank you for that. Uh, we love you, Lord, and I pray that you would receive this time as, as a gift to you. We want to grow in knowledge of you. We want to be sanctified by your word, because your word is truth. And I do pray tonight, Lord, that you would bless us because of this. In your name we ask these things. Amen.